Shalom Aleichem, everybody. And welcome tonight. It's a very, very special night. Um, as um, we welcome all of you here that are live with us tonight. Um, on the night of the yard site, the first yard site of my father-in-law, Mendy Gorin, Menachem Mendel Ben Elchanan. I'm joined here also by my wife, Jamie. And um, this is a very, very auspicious night uh, for all of us. A very, uh, lots of mixed emotions and feelings are, are, are in the air right now. And uh, we are privileged uh, tonight uh, for all of us here to join together uh, to hear amazing words of Torah by one of the top world lecturers in the world, in the world, of course, uh, Rabbi Y.Y. Y. Jacobson, who is here with us today. Um, and we'll also have some words as well, who is joining us as well as Rabbi Eliezer Wolf from the Beit David Highland Lake Shul. Um, and I just want to briefly uh, say this is very uh, special, important for various reasons. Number one, Rabbi Jacobson, I know I could see you, you're moving in and out, but um, I had, <laughs> um, for, for me, it's uh, very special uh, because number one, uh, Rabbi Jacobson was a important uh, integral part. Mendy got me and all his sons-in-laws um, to join him on a trip to go to the Ukraine uh, with Rabbi Y.Y. Jacobson. Um, and uh, that, since that trip, uh, I could tell you on a personal level, uh, and I know from the other words that were partaking in this trip, it was an incredible experience for all of us to, to really uh, feel what the holiness and the Kedusha were visiting all these kevers of all these different tzaddikim. And with Rabbi Jacobson on the microphone on a bus ride uh, for many days, just telling stories and words of Torah. It was an incredible experience and I'll never forget it. Uh, of course, I'll never forget it because of all the Torah that you taught Rabbi and all the stories that you gave, but more importantly, because it was an opportunity for me, as well as my other family members to bond uh, with Mendy on this trip. Uh, he made a very big effort. Uh, he pushed all our wives, said, let us, let us go, let us go, you know, and, and uh, it wasn't easy to do, but, uh, um, I'm very grateful to Mendy, who is actually probably listening right now as we speak. And um, um, yeah. So um, thank you again, Rabbi, for partaking with this in this, in this uh, incredible uh, event tonight. And I also want to thank my mother-in-law, Helga Gorin, who is an integral part of putting this whole thing together. Without her, uh, this event would not have happened. Um, and so I, I know that for us, it's all very important because Rabbi, you were his favorite, you were Mendy's favorite lecturer and teacher. And I know you guys go also go way back, which I'm sure you can go ahead and, and, and talk about as well. And so it's just as an amazing thing. And I know he's watching right now. So um, with that being said, I also want to, again, thank you from all of us in the family and um, all the sponsors that uh, put in tonight uh, to help in ra raising the neshama of, of of Mendy for the Lighthouse Horror Project. As people know, we, we do classes every single day in his name for the last five and a half years. We've done thousands of classes in his name and we're gonna continue giving Torah classes in his name uh, forever. Until so Mashiach comes and he could be resurrected immediately. Bezrat Hashem, it should happen immediately. Amen, everybody, amen. Um, with that being said, I wanna introduce Rabbi Eliezer Wolf, Rabbi of the Beit David Heinle Lake Shul, also an integral part of very close, close with Mendy and the family. And uh, let me go ahead and get you unmuted, Rabbi. Thank you very much. Michael, <clears throat> Michael, thank you very much for coordinating this special evening, you and your family, on behalf of the Lighthouse Project, as we begin a very special day for your family, for our community, and really for Kalal Yisrael. It's Mendy's first yard site. And it's impossible to share what I really want to, what I'm feeling. But by introduction, before we get the schus to hear Rabbi Jacobson teach us Torah tonight, I want to just share a little snippet about Mendy, our friend Mendy, a deep chaver of mine also. And I shared a little bit of this in the synagogue earlier when we prayed Mariv and we said Kaddish from Mendy. You know, they say about musicians, a lot of people can play music, you know, and they play the notes right. 
But sometimes what sets apart the one musician from another musician is not only the notes that they play, but is the pause and the space in between those notes. If you do that right, you're an extra good musician. We're in Tishrei, and Tishrei was one of Mendy's favorite months, which says a lot about a person. When Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, I will bring a person to life. And Mendy's birthday was Sukkot, and he passed in this month of Tishrei. And for us, he was the Baltokeya, he was the chauffeur blower in the synagogue for many, many, many years. Anyone who was there has unbelievable memories of memory of Mendy's shofar blowing. And this year we had the schus to blow his shofar. It wasn't him blowing, but we had his shofar. But what I share tonight is that whilst we all remember Mendy's shofar blowing, there's another part of the whole ceremony that not everyone paid attention to, but for me was extra special. Between the different blasts, we do three sets of, of 10 blasts. If you follow the Siddur, it says that the Baltakeya blows 10 blasts. And then it says two words in very small writing. It says, Visvade Balachash. You should make a quiet confession. And then you do the next blast, another confession, and then the next blast. And everyone always asks, what does it mean? What, should, what does it mean to make a quiet confession? But the Rebbe explains that it's not so much a confession because Rosh Hashanah is not the time for a confession, but it means ga'agu'im. It means to experience a kind of soul yearning, soul ecstasy, excitement to crown Hashem as king once again. And when he looked at Mendy, the shofar blowing was amazing. But if you looked at him between the blasts, his, his eyes, his face, his focus, his being immersed into the specialty of the day, you saw a neshama that was very special, somebody who was completely attentive and immersed to the spirit of the day and was the perfect shliach tzibur to pray on our behalf. And that says everything about Mendy because of all of the great things that we know and that we saw about him, some of the most special things about him are the things most people do not know and did not see. And in these very quiet moments and these very private moments in his home or the small times that we had together one-on-one, -on -one, we saw the greatness of Mendy's tzidkus, Mendy's piety, Mendy's devotion, his sincerity, his kavana, his kindness, and his chesed, and his misirat nefesh. So that's a lesson that we can all take away on this yard site. I'm looking forward to a whole day of learning tonight and tomorrow. We're very honored tonight that Rabbi Jacobson, Rabbi Y.Y. Jacobson, is going to teach us some Torah about these days between Yom Kippur and Sukkot, the special time that we're in. And like Michael said, we've had many, many chances with Mendy to learn and have brain with Rabbi Jacobson. I want to thank you for being here. And uh, many of you, I'm sure tonight, have heard him before, you know him, and we're in for a real treat. And so without further ado, we want to give Rabbi Jacobson a blessing. Hashem should bless you and your mishpacha with a healthy year and a good year. All good things, they continue to be matzliach, to spread Torah and to spread chasidut all over the world and to bring the souls of all people closer to our Father in heaven. Hashem everyone, for joining us. Rabbi Jacobson, I'm sure that the uh, people in charge here will help you get on and unmute and spotlight you. And thank you for being here. A good bench to you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Wolf, for your very kind uh, introductory words. Thank you so much, my dear friend Michael, for your earlier comments. I just need a thumbs up from somebody that you can hear me and see me. Rabbi Wolf, thumbs up. You hear me and see me? Okay, beautiful. So I'm just going to shut the volume by me so we won't have any disturbances. One second, my friends. Okay, beautiful. Thank you so, so much once again. Thank you, Helga, for the invitation. Thank you, Michael, for the invitation. I want to thank Mendy's entire family and welcome all of you, all of the members of the family. 
siblings, of course, children, in-laws, grandchildren, relatives, friends, all of the community members, nephews, nieces, and the entire beautiful Goren Mishpacha. And it's really a, uh, obviously a bitter and sweet moment. A bitter moment because a yard site, especially a first yard site, is never an easy time. There's always the element of loss and the void and the pain and missing somebody, especially such a special soul. And it's difficult. You look at a year, it seems surreal and really hard to uh, wrap your brain around it. On the other hand, there's also the sweetness of remembering such a special person, such a special soul, and such a special life. The Baal Shem Tov once said that when somebody passes away, there are three responses. One is tears. The other, silence. And the third, song. Tears, because we grieve for what we're missing. Silence, because no words can really capture the deepest relationships. So there is the sound of silence. And no words can capture the depth of loss and pain. So we're silent. Song, he said, because every soul represents a song. The journey of a soul is really a ballad. It's a song. Ashira Lashem Bechayoi. Life is a song. It's a symphony. And when a soul is taken, we sing in order to make sure that that soul's song is not interrupted, but it continues to resonate in the world through our lives, through our values, through our commitments, through our actions, words, and thoughts. And I'm in this yard site. I'm sure there's tears, there's silence, but there's also song. And as Chazal say, Ein Shira El there's the song of his life being continued by children, by the entire family, by friends, by relatives, by the community members, and by all those who have been touched by his unique touch, by his unique soul, his unique life and legacy. So we sing, and tonight is really that night of singing, of learning, of growing, and of connecting to such a neshama. As Michael said, we know that the neshama is present, is in tune, listens, watches, celebrates the joys of its loved ones, feels pain for the pain of its loved ones. And when we learn Torah here, it's a tremendous nachas, it's a tremendous pleasure, and certainly brings a profound spiritual smile to a neshama, a refined soul like Mendy. I remember that trip very well to the Ukraine a number of years ago. It was extremely special. We went to visit the resting place of the Baal Shem Tov in Mezhebuzh, the resting place of the Magad of Mizrich, the resting place of Rabbi Yitzhak of Bardichev, the resting place of the Balatanya of the Alter Rebbe, Rebbe Shnei Zaman of Liadi. It was an extremely meaningful, if tough trip. The physical accommodations weren't the best. We went to Niyezh and to the Mittler Rebbe, but it was extremely memorable and very powerful. And the way uh, you and your family absorbed everything was uh, extremely inspirational to me as well as be, being with all of you on that trip. And uh, Mendy had that uh, very powerful touch, you know, of knowing quality and identifying truth. He can sniff out truth. My relationship with Mendy began, Helga remembers, began probably two decades ago. I think it was two decades ago when I came to spend these days, the high holidays in your community. And uh, there was an instant bond because he was uh, a man of, and I don't say this lightly, a man with no ears, no ears about him, no ego, real, authentic, sincere, mature, very mature, very not petty. You know how Schulz have politics, not Highland Lake, but you know Schulz have politics. He was beyond politics. It was very refreshing. You know, people, Jews get caught, some, some people get caught up in small stuff. 
maybe after Yom Kippur, not anymore. But sometimes we get caught up, we become petty. Arguments, confrontations, you said this, I did this, he did this, she said this, blah, 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 blah. People live their whole lives that way. Mendy was not a small person. Petty, he didn't, he understood it, but he wouldn't become part of it. And he had a certain, uh, you know, you, you saw it in his eyes. He was smart, he wasn't naive, but he wasn't petty, he was bigger. He understood the bigger picture. He was ultimately sincere. He believed in goodness and he believed that people's times, people's time has to be used not for foolish superficiality, mediocrity, pettiness, smallness. He had his vision on the target. I have an old joke. I shared this probably with you guys. Uh, Moshe Dayan was the defense minister of Israel. He had a patch on his eye. You remember Moshe Dayan? He's driving on an Israeli highway at 120 miles per hour. In Israel, it's not that fast. And the policeman stops and says, General Dayan, you ought to serve as a role model for Israeli society. I know, come on, you're driving like a madman. So Moshe Dayan looks at the policeman. He says, listen, my dear officer, I got only one eye. Now, what would you like me to do with that eye? Look at the speedometer or look at the highway? Many people in life only look at the speedometer. I'm going fast, I'm going slow. Mendy Gorin had the ability, he looked at the highway. He had vision, he saw the bigger picture. He knew what is important and what is unimportant. What you fight for, what you don't fight for. He did not sweat the small stuff. He had deep values. And his deepest values were his loyalty to his family, to his friends, to his community, to the Jewish people to Torah, to mitzvahs, to Hashem, and to MS, to truth. His commitment. He was not selfish. He knew how to give, and he knew how to be there. He was a servant of God and a servant of the Jewish people. There was always that interesting thing about Hanukkah. I know we're holding Sukkot, but Sefer Hashmanayim says the reason Hanukkah is eight days is because they couldn't celebrate Sukkot eight days. So they did Hanukkah instead. So it's connected, Sukkot and Hanukkah. You know, on Hanukkah, you go the first night, how many candles? One. There's two. No, it's a shamash. doesn't count. How many candles? Seven. No, there's eight. Oh, the shamash doesn't count. How many candles tonight? Eight. There's nine. No, the shamash doesn't count. Shamash never counts. He lights all the candles, but he doesn't count. And yet the shamash is usually higher than all of the other candles. Because the greatest heights that a person could reach is when he or she becomes a shamash. When you realize that you're a conduit, you're a servant, you're an ambassador. You kindle everybody else's light. And it's not about you. And in that, you transcend above all. And in many ways, that describes very much, I think, Mendy. His service, his commitment. He didn't have to stand out. He didn't have to shine as the candle. He was happy to be the shamash behind the scenes, which comes from a very deep sincerity, a maturity, a greatness, somebody who sees the bigger picture. And I never saw politics in him. I never heard him speak negatively about people. He, he understood characters, but he didn't allow himself to get entangled in katnos, in smallness. And, you know, sometimes in communities, it's not always the easiest thing but it was extremely, extremely admirable. He also had Yerushamayim. He had fear of heaven in the positive sense of the word awe, reverence. His soul was not for sale. Now you may say, that's what's the big deal. It's a big deal. His soul was not for sale. His conscience was clear, dedicated, pure, real, as we heard from Rabbi Wolf now about the pauses in the middle of Tkiyas Shaifer. All my interactions with him over many, many years, I was always struck by the sincerity, the bikush, the search for truthfulness, the yearning for authenticity, and the ability to identify it, see it, and stick with it. Some people have a sensitivity to truth, but even after they identify it, they still sit on the fence, they fluctuate. It's the nature of the human condition. Not with him. He had a stubbornness. I know the word stubborn is not always good, but he had a certain inner tenacious connection and commitment that he, his soul would not budge. He knew, where, he knew where it's at. 
They can identify truth. And uh, it was a privilege to know him. He fought hard. He fought very hard. He had courage. He had resolve. He had commitment. And he cared. I know how much he cared for his wife, how much he cared for all of his children, how much he cared for his in-laws, how much he cared for the whole mishpach, all the grandchildren, all the generations, and how much he cared for siblings and nephews and nieces and great-nephews and great-nieces, and by extension, his friends, his community. He really, really cared. And there was something also unbelievably inspiring, and that is he understood what it means to do a favor for somebody without drama. There are people who do favors, but you'll hear about it for many years. <laughs> you know, their plaque is all over the place. And if it's not, you'll hear about it. He can really do favors, big ones, financial, emotional, social, in work, real favors to people. They, would, they didn't even have to know. It was real. It was what's called he knew that he works for God. He doesn't work for other people. And such people become ambassadors of love and light because they don't need anybody's validation. They're not busy pleasing this one or that one. And they also, he couldn't, he didn't mind if somebody had criticism. He was not, he was a very self-effacing individual. Some people have egos. They're very insecure. He was not, he knew who he was. And he didn't have to be right. He didn't have to be perfect. He had a certain simplicity in a very powerful way, a humility, a simplicity. In Perkyovas is an expression, al tagzik ki Sages say, even if you learned a lot, don't get pompous. You were created for this. You're doing the purpose of your creation. It's a very simple but very deep statement. Don't get arrogant on us. Don't take yourself so seriously. There are people who take themselves very seriously and the cause they don't take so seriously. Mendy was the opposite. The cause he took very seriously. Himself, he didn't take so seriously. He could laugh at himself. Fortunate is the human being who knows how to laugh at himself, who knows how to make fun of himself but takes the cause seriously. These people don't stand in the way of light, of energy. They know how to get out of the way and become conduits. It was a privilege to know him. He was a great neshama, a special human being, an exceptional human being, an extraordinary family person, honest, real, authentic, straight. He was not crooked. He said what he meant. He meant what he said. Each one of these are extraordinary virtues. And I hope everybody who's listening, especially family, younger, younger ones, will learn from this, emulate it, try to internalize these qualities in your life. Because there are qualities that make a life unique. They set one apart. They leave an impact, not only when you're here, also after you leave. These are values that remain timeless and eternal because they inspire generations. I was sent a video last year of his last Kia Schaefer, right? I think it was the end of Yom Kippur when he insisted on his bed literally a few hours before his passing, a day before his passing to blow the Schaefer. I watched the video. It was extremely, extremely emotional because he put in his soul into that blowing. And as he blew the Schaefer, I was thinking, it says, in the Shulchan Aruch, Shulchan Aruch Harav, earlier sources, we blow the shofar at the end of Yom Kippur to represent the fact that the Shechina goes up. Siluk Shechina, the Shechina goes up. And in many ways, he blew the shofar, and a few minutes later, a few hours later, his Neshama went up. His Shechina went up, because a Neshama is a Chelek Elekami Ma'al Mamach, it's a part of the Shechina. And as he was exhaling the ear, Vayipach Ba'ap of Nishma Schayim, it's like Hashem, also exhales and blows a soul. And as he exhaled, the air was like one of the last ones before Hashem inhaled and took back his soul. And for me, it was very symbolic of a way to close your life. And 
as Rabbi Eliezer Wolf just mentioned, Rabbi Eli Wolf just mentioned, he was a shoifer. He was an alarm clock. The Rambam says we blow shoifer to wake people up. Nobody likes alar their alarm clock. Mendy was an alarm clock. He was a conscience. He woke people up. He did not stand for corruption. He did not stand for stupidity. He did not stand for negativity. He wanted action. He wanted mice. He wanted emes. He was a shoifer. He blew the shoifer. Not just physically, but also symbolically. And at the end of his life, he wanted to blow that show for one last time. And I saw there was a smile deep in his body and his neshama as he managed to blow, probably knowing very well what situation he is. And I think it's a remarkable lesson in life. And that is, even, even at the very end, don't stop blowing the shofar. You know, many people, they blow, but at some point they give up. They surrender. He did not surrender. He fought and fought hard tenaciously. And he did not stop blowing that shofar, not physically and not symbolically. May all of you and all of us continue to blow his shofar, continue to blow his sounds, continue to sing his song, La'arichis Yomim V'shanim Toivis, and a special blessing to the whole family. May all of you enjoy many, many long, happy, healthy years filled with happiness, prosperity, good health, bracha and atzlocha, harchavis hadaz, menuchas hanefesh, menuchas hagof, and all the desires of your heart, may they be fulfilled this year. And I'm sure that your father, husband, uncle, great uncle, father-in-law, Zaidi, all the titles, friend, is going to continue to serve as an everlasting source of blessing, inspiration, light to all of you and to all of the Jewish people. And you and we will continue to give great delight and nachas to his, to his soul until the great moment when all of us will be reunited with our loved ones. And may it be this year, Tavshin Payalov, as the Chsam Seifer says, may Ashpais Yarim Evian, Tehei Nishmasei Tzuri Betzur HaChayim, may his soul be bound up eternally with the bond of life, especially on a first yard site. After the 12 months, when a soul experiences a whole different level of a spiritual elevation as discussed in works of Kabbalah at length, the unique transformation that happens to a soul after a full year in the Olam Ha'emes, in the world of truth. And to remember a soul never dies, never ever dies. Goes through changes, goes through a lot of spiritual fluctuations, travels in different spiritual environments and worlds but it never dies, never ceases. It forever remains connected to all of us, and we remain forever connected to all of to it because the soul, the essence of a person, can die just like godliness can die, just like life can die. That which is alive ultimately doesn't die. Our theme this evening is the four days between Yom Kippur and Sukkot, the yard site, Yud Beis Tishrei, following Yud Aleph Tishrei, following Yom Kippur. And we have the four days, Yud Aleph, Yud Beis, Yud Gimel, Yud Dalet. Four days, four letters. And we're going to learn a little bit about these four days and these four letters and the transition between Yom Kippur and Sukkot. There is a fascinating and a little strange Jewish custom that the day after Yom Kippur, which is today, Yud Aleph, or this past day, is known as God's Nomen in Yiddish, Hashem's name. In Hebrew, they called it B'Shem Hashem. Why? Why would this day, Yud Aleph Tishrei, be called God's name, Hashem's name? Every, every day is part of Hashem, I mean. So there's, from the Baal Shem Tif, a very, very interesting explanation. One comes from the Eishel Avram. The Eishel Avram is a commentary on Shulchan Aruch by somebody known as the Buchache Rav, the Rav of Buchach was one of the great Goinim, and actually I have a grandson, a neighbor of mine, a few blocks here in Muncie, who has a shul called the Shul of Buchach. He's a grandson of the Eishel of Ram of Buchach. And in Shulchan Aruch, in the back of Arachayim, Hilchis Yema Kippurim, Simen Tov he says something that he heard from his son. I think his son's name was Rabbi Yaakov, 
or heard it from Reb Nachman, from the Balsham, the name of the Balsham Tev. The reason we call you an Aleph Tishrei Gotz Naman is because till after Yom Kippur, we identify Hashem and Shemayin Esra as HaMelech HaKadosh. From Rosh Hashanah through Yom Kippur, Baruch Atah Hashem, not HaKel HaKadosh, but HaMelech HaKadosh, the Holy King. But the day after Yom Kippur, including the night after Yom Kippur, we shift back to HaKel HaKadosh. So it becomes God's name, and we start identifying God by His name, because one of the seven names of Hashem that you're not erase is the name Kale, Aleph, Lamed, Kale, which is one of the names of Hashem in Chumash. And also in the Yud Gimel Midas, Hashem, Hashem, Kale, Racham, Vachanon, Aleph, Lamed. So the Baal Shem Tov says, Till Yom Kippur, Hashem has like this title, this nickname, HaMelech HaKadosh, the Holy King. But the night after Yom Kippur, he goes back to having a name. <laughs> <laughs> Not a melech, a kela kaddish, the holy God, the holy kale. That's why it's called God's nom and b'shem Hashem. There's another interpretation brought from the Baal Shem Tev, a second one, also from the Baal Shem Tev, and the two somehow are connected. It's uh, brought in Sefer Ginzei Nistaris, a little deeper. It says by Yom Kippur, Ki bayoy mazei yechaper aleichem, letayir eschem ekel chateseichem, lifnei Hashem titaru. On this day, Hashem will forgive you from all your sins. Before Hashem, you will become cleansed. Lifnei Hashem titaro. What does it mean, before Hashem, you will be cleansed? Literally, it means in His presence. But the word lifnei has a dual interpretation. Lifnei means before. Lifnei also means before as in preceding it, right? You say, lifnei meloich melech. Chronologically, you'll say, lifnei shanaladeta, before you were born, this and this happened. So lifnei could mean you're standing lifnei amelech in front before the king in the present. That's one more meaning. But lifnei also in Tanakh means something else. It means before. Right? Hu nolad lifnei ploini. He was born before this person. In parashas vayishlach elam melachem hashemol chuberitz edom lifnei meloich melach. So in Kabbalistic and Hasidic writings, it says lifnei Hashem titaru doesn't only mean in front of Hashem. It means lifnei Hashem. Cleansing comes from that which is before Hashem. What does that mean? Nothing before Hashem. Hashem is the source of everything. Like the Rambam opens up his Mishnah Torah. The answer is, lifnei Hashem is lifnei yud kei vav kei Before that which transcends the letters yud and he and vav and he. Because the letters of Hashem's name, yud and he and vav and he, represent the way infinite divine energy is compressed and articulated in modalities that can ultimately constitute the source of creation. Hashem is the engine of creation. The gas, the fuel, the creator, the designer, the sculpturer, the design, and the, the sustainer. Hashem creates all of the worlds and he constitutes the energy of all the universes. Everything that exists is divine energy. From the black hole, to a mosquito, from a, 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 a wasp, to a, uh, to a bee, to a little bug, to a turtle, to a rhinoceros, a buffalo, to the largest planet. Everything constitutes of divine energy. Every atom, every cell, every particle, every molecule, every single thing in our universe is alive, it's vibrant. What, what is its life? Its life is the Dvar Hashem, the divine energy. Every blade of grass and every flake of snow, every droplet of rain and every grain of sand, every bush, every shrub, every plant, every tree, every legume, every vegetable, every reptile, insect, mammal, bird, fish, organic matter, inorganic matter, including the 70 trillion cells that are floating around in your body and my body. It's all divine energy. That's what creates it. It constitutes its chemistry. It, keep it, it keeps it together. And it's basically divided into four levels of energy, Yud and He and Vav and He. In the Svarim, in the holy books, it's explained that these four letters con constitute the 10 spheres, which are the 10 building blocks of creation, the 10 energies with which God expresses himself and builds the whole universe, the entire cosmos, physical universe, our planet, and also the spiritual universes. 
Yud represents Chachma, He represents Bina, Vav represents the six Midos, the six emotions, and then the last He represents Malchus. So you have here the ten Sephiris, Yud and He and Vav and He. Explained at length in the third section of Tanya, Igeris HaTshuva. And so, the name of Hashem, Yud and He and Vav and He, really represents the way infinite energy is filtered and channeled into mediums and structures that allow God's divine energy to become the engine and constitute the chemistry and the essence of every single created being. So this represents channels, mediums, conduits, that infinite energy should be able to be channeled in a way that it should be able to become a planet, a star, a mammal, a human being, a drop of rain, an ocean, everything in the world. Everything has its own unique physical chemistry. It has its own unique spiritual chemistry. It's the spiritual chemistry that constitutes the source of the physical chemistry. And the spiritual chemistry is rooted in God's four letters, Yud Kei Vav Kei. That's why the Kabbalists say they correspond to the four worlds. They correspond to the four elements, A, Shru, Achmayim, Afar, fire, ear, water, earth, or if you want gas, liquid, matter, antimatter, or ga- ga- gas, solid, liquid, etc., energy. So these are all different states of spiritual energy, the way they translate into physical energy. Yud and He and Vav and He. When a person sins, they disrupt the flow of life. There's a flow of life. And we create dissonance. That's what chet is. Chet is dissonance. I become misaligned. My behavior and me become misaligned. In other words, I'm not in touch with my energy. You know how sometimes you feel heavy and lethargic? Your energy is not flowing. It's blocked. That's why we do exercise. That's why we meditate. That's why we take a walk. That's why we go into ourselves. That's why we relax. You want to get back with your energy. You got to clean out the system. You clean out the body, you know, juicing as they do in Florida. You got to juice. You got to clean out the toxicity. You want to create an alignment between your body and your energy. The same is true psychologically and spiritually. Every hate, hate doesn't mean sin. The real meaning of hate is missing the target. It's a show which shoot arrows and he never missed the target. Hate is you miss. Chase is not just I sin, it's much deeper than sin. What does sin really mean? It means I missed the target. It means I'm not in touch with who I am. It means there's a, a misalignment, there's a dissonance between me and me, and it's very painful. Tshuva means you create alignment, you create, you get rid of the dissonance, you create harmony, alignment in your life. So whenever we sin, it affects either Yud or He or Vav or He, one of the four letters, which is basically the energy levels. How do you cleanse? You have to go Lifnei Hashem Titaro. You have to go higher than Yud Kei Vav Kei. Lifnei, that which is before Yud Kei Vav Kei. You got to reach into the infinite essence because over there, there's always a wholesome relationship. So even if there was a disruption in the energy of God that is flowing through my psyche and through my body on a conscious level, Lifnei Hashem, if I could f- touch that place which is beyond Yudke Vavke, precedes Yudke Vavke, over there, Titharu. Over there, you can be cleansed. Over there, there's also the infinite energy, so you can always get from there energy to bring back and fill up your system. Practically speaking, it means if somebody is suffering from trauma, or somebody is suffering from dissonance, or somebody is suffering from misalignment, you got to go Lifnei Hashem to go to a place that's higher than your yud and your hay and your vav and your hay. You have to go to the deepest reservoirs of your soul and your body because that's where trauma cannot impact you. All abuse, all trauma, all uh, dissonance in my life can only happen on the level of energy that is channeled through specific filters of consciousness. However, when it comes to the core essence of the soul that is a manifestation of God's infinity, deeper than Yudke Vavke, what the Zoyar calls Ru'usa Delib, the core of the heart, over there there's always wholesomeness. It can't get broken. The Balatanya says in the Torah, whenever the Torah says, V'nichris nefesh, the soul gets cut off, it's only the level of Yaakov, not the level of Yisrael. Yaakov is the way the soul comes into the Akiv, to the heel. The way the soul is manifested in lower levels of consciousness, even the subconscious, but it's manifested in more tangible levels, over there you can get cut off. 
But he says there's another state of the soul that is echad yachid umiyuchad. Echad yachid umiyuchad. Always one with the source with infinity, and there's no interruption over there. So Yom Kippur is lifnei Hashem titaru. You go to a place that's deeper than Yudke Vavke, that's beyond the names. From there comes all the cleansings. But then you have to bring it down into the names. So now you have the four days between Yom Kippur and Sukkot. So you bring it down into the Yud and into the He and into the Vav and into the He. And then you're ready for Sukkot. And that's why these day, the, name, the day after Yom Kippur is called God's Nomen, Hashem's name. After going to a place that is beyond names, now begins the process of communicating it into the name. And then comes Sukkot. And here we have an extraordinary medrash and really very startling. The medrash says in Parshas Emmer, it says, On the first day of Sukkot, you should take a beautiful fruit, an esrig, the four species and shake them and celebrate seven days before Hashem. Hashem So the Medrash Rabbah says, Rishon, why is it called the first day? It's really the 15th day of the month. Sukkot begins on the 15th. So the Medrash answers, Rishon Lechesh Ben It's the first day of calculating sins. Why is Sukkot the first day of calculating sins? So some want to explain it. Because on Yom Kippur, everybody is forgiven. Four days between Yom Kippur and Sukkot, nobody has time to sin. Everybody is busy. We have Mendy's yard site learning a whole day. You're building Sukkot. You're buying Lulavim. You're buying an Esra. You're trying to prepare food. You're inviting guests. You know, people are busy. It's a hectic time in the Jewish communities between Yom Kippur and Sukkot. Everyone, my life, my gate, my heart, everybody is busy. So when is the first time people relax? Sukkot, first night of Sukkot. Come into the Sukkot, everything is made, everything is prepared, you have a ready Sukkot, you have a Lulav. Now people could start sinning. That's how some explain why it's called Rishon L'Chesh Ben Avoynes. But it seems like a very distasteful explanation. Why should we suspect that Jews, after Yom Kippur, come into the Sukkot, the first night of Sukkot, they're going to sin. Maybe they'll sit in the Sukkot and they'll sing and they'll dance, and they'll celebrate Simchas Beis Hashem, and they'll speak words of Torah, and words of Avos Hashem, and Avos Ater, and Avos Yisrael. Why are we suspect that Torah, the Torah, calls the first day of Sukkot Yom Arishan, even though it's the 15th, because it's the first day of sins? Come on. Why be such so pessimistic, and like believe that everybody's going to sin on the first day of Sukkot? I have been to many Sukkot who wants to sin on the first night of Sukkot. Okay, sometimes people could fall prey, but this becomes like the expression of Torah for the first day of Sukkot. Something is off. Most beautiful interpretation, a lot of interpretations. Famous interpretation of the Vilna Gaon, uh, Teferis Shloimeh, interpretation of Bichatzkel of Kuzme, a lot of nice interpretations. But it's beyond the realm of our class. We could sit all night. I'm going to give you one interpretation of the Baditshevi Rav, the Kedusha Slevi, the Holy of Levitzik of Baditshev. By the way, his yard set is also Tishrei. And in fact, the story goes that he was very sick. He was getting sick. It was Sukkot time. And he asked Hashem, he said, I just want to fulfill do one more Sukkot. And then I'm ready. And after Sukkot, the day after Sukkot, he passed away. The Baditshever, Tov Kuf Ayin, 18, 1809. Many ways. I think Mendy had the same thing with Yom Kippur, right? I think his wife told me, or one of, one of you guys, one of the children told me that he, or the nephew, Isaac maybe, that he, uh, he, uh, he wanted to wait till the end of Yom Kippur. He wanted, he wanted Yom Kippur. He wanted to blow the shofar. After Yom Kippur was done, okay, now I'm ready. Lifnei Hashem Titaru. The Holy Baditshiva says something special, something special. And we went, we went then with the trip. We went to the roots of Baditshiva, remember? We went to Hadditch, to Ukraine. We went first, before that, we went to Baditshiva. So, in Kedusha Slavery, Rebbe Levitzek of says, that the Talmud, the Gemara says in Yuma, page 86b, Daf Pevav, the Shlokish says there's two types of tshuva, two types of repentance. There's repentance out of awe and there's repentance out of love. When you repent out of awe, out of reverence, out of fear, fear of God, even a fear that's healthy and amazing, and it's awe, reverence, then he says your sins are transformed into mistakes. God says, okay, it's a bunch of mistakes. I forgive you. When you do tshuva out of love, then your sins are transformed into mitzvahs. When a Jew repents to Hashem with love and affection, 
then retroactively, all the sins become transformed to mitzvahs. Why? So the Tanya says in chapter 7, because the very love that a person experiences to Hashem, by definition, is accelerated and fueled and empowered by my mistakes, by my previous mistakes. There is no appreciation like the appreciation that comes after a mistake. We all know when somebody falls ill, God forbid, they appreciate their health much more. When a couple was at the verge of drifting apart and then they come back together, it's a much stronger and deeper bond. If I haven't had a drink in a long time and then I get a cold cup of water, my thirst is quenched and there's an enthusiasm and an appreciation for the water that I don't have. People who had difficulty breathing, especially recently with the corona, they get back their breath. They don't take it for granted. I'll call nishima unishima. And the same is true with every situation in life. Whenever you had to, uh, whenever you lost something or you experienced a serious challenge and you faced adversity, and then you learn from that what not to do, you rebound, you come back with a much deeper zeal. So what happens is the very sin of a Jew fuels the love to Hashem when the person does truth. And therefore, the sin itself prompts a deeper love. It becomes a catalyst, a springboard for a new awareness, for rebirth, for renaissance, for metamorphosis, for transformation. A very cute story may even be a true story about the legendary, um, the legendary CEO of IBM. His name was, I think, Henry Watson. They tell a story that one of his managers made a terrible, terrible business mistake, and he cost the company $10 million in losses. And uh, it was a disaster. I mean, it's $10 million in losses. It was by mistake. He didn't mean to do it, but he made a terrible financial uh, miscalculation and he cost the company 10 million bucks. <sighs> the next day he comes in to Mr. Watson and he presents his uh, resignation papers. Watson says, what's this? He says, well, the least I can do is just resign and quit and you don't have to pay me anything, no severance pay. It's the least I can do just to be a mensch. You know, I, I can't pay back this loss. I don't got this money, but at least I could resign. And Henry Watson looked at him and said, resign now? You're crazy. You're not going anywhere. I just paid $10 million for your education. Where do you think you're going? And of course, such loyalty you can't buy. And he remained the most loyal, loyal manager. Because Watson understood it was a mistake. But the moment you turn a mistake into an education, then it may have been the best thing you ever did. <laughs> When a mistake becomes an education, it's not a mistake. It's only a mistake if it remains a mistake. But if the mistake becomes a, a springboard, a catalyst, it becomes the genesis of, of a new awareness, then it's not a mistake. You know, I know people in recovery, and I'm, the people who are really in recovery, the way they are sober, the way they live is very inspiring because they know the other side. Their addiction, when transformed, becomes such a powerful tool in recovery. I'm talking about people who are really in recovery. I'm not talking about con artists who are lying to those who enable them. What happens is the addiction itself fuels the recovery because the mistake becomes the most powerful education. They know about lies like nobody else, and they will run from it as fast as possible because they have been in the abyss. And when I have been in the abyss, when I tasted the taste of purgatory and I got out of it, then the purgatory itself becomes a tremendous asset. This is the meaning of the Gemara, that when a Jew does tshuva out of love, then my mistakes, my errors, my transgressions, my violations, my sins, my distortions... They become like mitzvahs. Why do they become like mitzvahs? Because retroactively they're transformed from sins into catalysts for great mitzvahs. Comes to Blavid Zagabadichev and says, Ah, Rosh Hashanah and Yim Kippur, people do tshuva, but tshuva is usually then done out of awe, yira. In fact, yira, the Shalah says, is the acronym. What's yira? So you have Elul, Aleph is Elul, 
and then you have Rosh Hashanah, and then you have Yom Kippurim. That's the time of year. Ubechein tein pach decha shamalekeinu v'yei moscha akol masha barosa v'yira ucha kol amaisim. This is the time we tell Hashem. Ubechein tein pach decha shamalekeinu. Place your fear, your awe, your reverence on all of your creation. That's this time of the year. So it's tshuva out of fear, out of awe, out of reverence. Hamelech Hakadosh. That's what we say. This was the davening we said yesterday and Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. It's a time of awe, of reverence. What happens when you do tshuva out of awe? All the sins are treated like mistakes and they're forgiven. Comes the Badit and says, Sukkis is mansim chaseinu, a time of joy. Sukkis is the time of love. Tshuva me'av, tshuva out of love. That's what the sukkah is. What's the sukkah? The sukkah is v'yeminu techapkeni. It's God's embrace of the Jewish people. And we're going to get, I'm going to tell you an incredible story about the Baal Shem Tov in a moment. Sukkah is Hashem embracing the Jewish people. There's a sense of joy, a sense of love. The Badit Shuvah says, Sukkah is you do tshuva, but tshuva out of love. Different type of tshuva. What happens when you do tshuva out of love? All the sins are transformed into mitzvahs. Ah, now we understand the Medrash. Medrash says, why is the first day of Sukkah called Yom Rishin? It's Rishin Lechesh Ben Avoynes. It's the first day of calculating the sins. Why are we calculating sins? Says Levi Tzikah Baditshev, because Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur Hashem took your sins and he threw them away. He cast them away. It's gone. It's a mistake. Forget it. That's Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. But Sukkot, what happens? Sukkot, the sins are mitzvahs. All your mistakes become an education. They become a catalyst for a new appreciation of life. Sukkot, you look back at your sins and you say, God says, Rishon l'chesh ben avoynas, bring me back the sins. I want to calculate every sin. You know why? Because each sin is now a mitzvah. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, I threw away the sins. Sukkot. Cheshben, bring them all back. I want to cal- make a calculation of each sin because every sin is now redefined retroactively from being an act of sinfulness to being redefined as an act that really turned you into the person you're capable of becoming. And to see how meticulous this is, take a look at the difference of Rosh Hashanah and Sukkot. What's the custom on Rosh Hashanah? We go for tashlich. What's tashlich? We go to the water and we cast our sins into the water. We say then the verse from Micah, the tashlich yom kol chataisam. Cast into the depths of the sea all their sins. So what happens on tashlich, Rosh Hashanah? We take our sins, we throw it into the water. Kaput. It's in the water. That's Rosh Hashanah. What happens on Sukkot? Sukkot, there was a mitzvah known as Nisu Chamayim, the pouring of the water. And that's what triggered what's known as Simchas Beis Sacheyeva. For seven nights of Sukkot, they used to dance all night. All night they would dance. The Talmud says in Masech the Sukkah, Somebody who did not see the joy by the drawing of the water did not see joy in his or her life. The greatest sages would come and dance away all the night. They would actually juggle torches of fire, the mission describes in Masech the Sukkah. There was such a joy, all of Jerusalem was enveloped and overwhelmed by this ecstatic jubilation and celebration of the seven nights of Sukkot. All night they would dance. And what happened after the dancing? Dancing was a preparation. For what? As dawn would break, procession of all the dancers and all the Jews would go down from the Temple Mount from the Harabayas and go down to a spring that you can visit today. It's called the Shiloyach Spring. Mayan HaShiloach. And over there, they would draw water. You draw water with joy from the wellsprings of salvation. And then they would make a procession back up and blow the shofar. And the Kayan would go up on the altar and pour every morning of Sukkot this water from the spring. Pour it on the altar was called Nisuch Hamayim. 
wait, 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 guys, what's happening? Rosh Hashanah, we went to the water. What did we do? We threw away all our sins into the water. Tashlich means throw it all away. Get rid of it. That's phase one. Sukkis, we go back to the water. We take our goblets, we pour it, we put it into the water, and we draw the water. Simchas beis hashayeva. What are you trying to do with the water? Ah, we are reclaiming our sins. Rosh Hashanah, we threw them away. Sukkis, we take them back. I want them. And we take this water. And we bring it up to the altar in the Bet HaMikdash, in the Holy Temple. And it becomes an offering for God. I don't understand. This water has all your sins. We just went there for Tashlich. No, no, no. Now the sins are sublimated and they're poured on God's altar. What does this mean in life? This means in life there's two phases of healing, my friends. Phase number one is you got to go away. You got to throw it away. This is what's called Tshuva Tata. It's remorse. It's regret. I have to say, this is not for me anymore. I am getting rid of these thoughts, these words, these actions, these habits, these addictions, these behaviors. This has been damaging. This has been destructive. I am out of this. You are finished with me. I am separating myself. Throw it away. Yom Kippur, we do the same thing. It's called the scapegoat. They would put all the sins on the goat and send it to the Azazel. What's that going to do? A goat is going to carry your sins? It represents something very profound. My sins are not me. Take your sins, put them on a goat, and let the goat go to the Azazel. You are not your sins. You are not your stress. You are not your anxiety. You are not your depression. You are not your fear. You are not your insecurity. You are not your skeletons. You are not your traumas. You are not your ghosts. You are not your demons. I take my sins. I place it on the goat. It means my essence is pure, is holy. That's always phase one. The ability to disassociate yourself from dysfunctionality and to say, I am not my anger. I am not my temper. I am not my meshagasan. I am not my jealousy. I am not my hatred. Who am I? I'm a chelek alekami mal. I'm divine. Lifne Hashem. That's phase one. Phase two in life is sukkahs, much deeper. Phase two in life is I learn from my mistakes what type of person not to be and what type of person to be. And then I can look back and I could say, ah, it was those mistakes. It was those downfalls. It was those failures. It was those stumbling blocks and setbacks that turned me into the person I became. Thank you. You can't go to step two without step one. You can't jump to Sukkot without Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. First you need Tashlich. First you got to throw it away. Then comes Sukkot. Rish and Lechesh ben Avaynes. Now go back to the water. Bring it all back. Bring it all back. They tell a story. Reb Melech of Lezhenz, the Holy Rebbe Reb Melech of Lezhenz went to Tashlich. And he finished Tashlich. And then a chassid jumped into the water. So the Rebbe of Melech says, Who springs to? What are you jumping into the water? He says, Ich will nehmen dem Rebbe Saveres. I want to take the Rebbe's sins. <laughs> I want to take home the Rebbe's sins. That's a story they say, a beautiful story. But now I'm going to tell you a little bit of a cynical story in, in the spirit of humor and jest. It's a cute story, a little cynical. Not, that long, not long ago, they say, there was another person who calls himself a Rebbe, and he also went for Tashlich, and he threw his sins into the water, and the Hasidim, in the old tradition, started to push, to jump into the water. So the Gabbai says, no, 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 no need to push, there's enough for everybody. But in all sincerity, what's this idea of Tashlich? You throw it away. So kiss, I come back, take it all back. Take back, you can look back at your life and you say, don't sit and cry and say, if, 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 I was so stupid, I was such an idiot, I was so dysfunctional. It's true, you made mistakes. But ultimately, everything, everything was allowed by God.
Yeah, I made bad choices. But like the Pinchas Koritzer says, Hashem is in the plural. It's not just me. Hashem also is a little bit responsible. He put me here, he put me there, he gave me my eight Sahari, he gave me my issues. It's not only me. We're in it together. Because Hashem wants the tshuva. He wants, he wants you to look from, from the abyss, from the darkness. You come to a much deeper place of awareness. Then you go back to the water. You reclaim your mistakes. And they themselves become part of the incredible, incredible journey of the soul. That's the Rishon L'Chesh Ben Avoynes, says the Baditshva that happens on Sukkot. So that's the process, you see? Lifnei Hashem Titaru Yom Kippur, you go beyond Yud Kei Then you got to go bring it down into life, into the Yud, into the He, into the Vav and the He. In other words, you have to be able to go to the place of infinity, bring it back down into the finiteness of Yud and He and Vav and He, and show the alignment, how ultimately even the disruption and the structure can become redefined by Lifnei Havaya, by Lifnei Yud Kei which is what is culminated on Sukkot after the four days, when we can go back to the water and reclaim all those mistakes. Which now brings us to another incredible point and a very powerful story. The Baal Shem Tev, the Holy Baal Shem Tev, once built a Sukkah, and the Sukkah, was filled with gaps and holes and blemishes. The sukkah was barely kosher. Those of you who learned Masech the sukkah or Shulchan Aruch sukkah know that sukkah is unique, that Jewish law allows for enormous amounts of loopholes, pun intended, that doesn't exist in any other area. For example, you have a hole in the schach, right? You have a hole here, you have a gap here, you have a gap there. Many of the situ- many of scenarios makes, still keeps the sukkah kosher. You have something called doifen akom, which means a crooked wall. What does it mean a crooked wall? Schach can't be a roof of, of, of plaster or of cement or of glass. But what happens if some people have a sukkah in their dining room? I don't know how it works by you guys. They have a sukkah in their dining room, right? So your ceiling opens up and you have schach. The problem is the walls are connected to the part of the ceiling that's not schach. So it's called doifen akom. As long as it's less than uh, six or eight feet between the schach and the wall, we imagine that it's a crooked wall. It's not a crooked wall. We imagine it's a crooked wall. Or you have mechitzes, you have walls that go up around 30 feet, but they don't reach the schach. They don't reach the schach. No problem. We say, good asik, pick up the walls. The same is true down. We could bring down the walls. You have lovud. If you have little spaces, we make believe the space is not there. There's a lot of loopholes in a sukkah. You don't even need four walls halachically. You have two complete walls, and then you have part of a third wall, and it's a good sukkah. Either there's no fourth wall, either third wall is open. You only have two walls. It's a fine sukkah. Again, you have to know all the details, but it's, it's a lot of loopholes in sukkah. So the Baal Shem Tev once built a sukkah, and he relied on every possible loophole to the point that the rabbis in Broad came and they checked out the sukkah, and they said it's possible, it's disqualified. And the Baal Shem Tev said, it's not true, it is. It's fine. And they argued and argued and argued, and he says, no, if you learn the halachas, you'll see it's fine. And they said, no. And the Baal Shem Tev put his hand on his forehead for a few minutes, and then they saw that a note fell down from the schach. They opened the note, and it was signed by the angel called Matat, and he said, the sukkah of Rabbi Saul Baal Shem Tev is kosher. The story doesn't make sense. Why couldn't the Baal Shem to fix a sukkah? Why did he have to make a sukkah that all the rabbis thought was a disqualified sukkah? Even if they were wrong and he was right because they missed something, they missed a loophole, pun intended. But why did he have to do that? Just bring another wall, fill in the gap. Why do you have to make a sukkah that's questionable? There's no mitzvah to make a, make a better sukkah. Even if your sukkah is kosher, why not make a nicer sukkah, better sukkah, more complete sukkah? Very strange. I'll tell you the answer. Take a different, the different thing, Pesach and Sukkot. Pesach is the opposite of Sukkot. The house is scrubbed. Perfection. Clean. Not a speck of chametz. I wanted to say not a speck of dust, because that's what happens in most Jewish homes. But let's not put the anxiety on at this point of the year. Not a speck of chametz. The house is perfect. perfect. 
tiny bit of chametz, mashu chametz, bal yino, bal yino, say, get it out, burn it, destroy it. We clean and we rub and we sweep and we vacuum and we mop and we get down on our knees and we check every hole and every crevice and every nook and every cranny to obliterate every last piece of leaven from our homes. We want the house to be, ah, bal yiro, bal yimotze. There shouldn't be a speck, a grain of chametz. That's Pesach. Sukkis is the opposite. We don't need a perfect sukkah. You can have holes everywhere. I told you, you could be missing a wall and a half and more, and you're good. Your schach could be mi- a lot of loopholes. Why the difference? What's the difference? I'll explain to you the difference. Pesach, we invite God into our home. Pesach, we say, Hashem, we want to have you know. The king comes to your house. If you would have the king, even not the king, the president, who are now debating. <laughs> who is in the debate now. Even have the president, whoever the president is, come to your house. You're going to clean up the house. MS. Even not the president. A guest comes, you clean up. Hashem is coming. Clean the house. Not once. You make it spotless. Spotless. The king is coming to your house for seven days, eight days. That's Pesach. Pesach, Hashem comes to my house. Hashem comes to your house. Sukkis. Hashem doesn't come to my house. He invites me to his house. Pesach, we invite God into our house. Sukkot, God invites us into his house. His house is the sukkah. The Kedusha Sasukkah, the Gemara says in Mesech Sukkot of Tess, Kishem Shechol, Shem Shemayim Al HaChagiga, Kach Kol Shem Shemayim Al HaSchach. Just like the name of heaven rests on the Chagiga, on the offering of Yom Tev Chag, Vasisa Chag HaSukkah, the Shem Shemayim dwells on the Sukkah. An incredible Svasemes. The Gemara asks, Sukkah Daf Hey, how do we know that a Sukkah can't be lower than 10 Tfachim? The, the roof can't be lower than around between 30 and 40 feet. It has to be taller. Can't be too high, but it can't be too low. You can't have, if your schach is lower than 30 feet, between 30 and 40 feet, lower than 10 tfachim, it's not good. You're not going. Even if you're sitting there, you're sleeping there, you're eating there, not good. Why? The Gemara calls it sukkah srucha. It's stinky. Why is it stinky? So Rashi says, because the pieces of schach are going to go into your eye and your nose and your ears. It's so short that the schach is so low, you're going to come in. It's going to be very uncomfortable. It's going to be awkward. It's, it's not nice. It's not geschmack. The schach has to be tall. But the Gemara says, how do we know that a sukkah has to be 10 tfachim? Because the Shekhinah never came down lower than 10 tfachim. So the Svasama says, what's the connection? And he says, because the Shekhinah dwells on the Shach. It's God's, it's God's roof. And the Shekhinah doesn't come down lower than 10 tfachim. So therefore the Shach has to be taller. And then he says, that's why it's called sukkah srucha. That's why it's called stinky. Because there's no Shekhinah there. <laughs> it's an interesting Svasemas. What do we see from here? The sukkah is God's home. The roof is the shechina. The walls is Hashem's hug. The priyat Chaim Darizal says, that's why halachically, on sukkah you can have one complete wall, and then a second complete wall, and then the third wall is ashlish is afilu tefach. He says, why? Because the walls of the sukkah is Hashem hugging you with his right arm. When I hug you with my right arm, right? How many walls are there? Here. I can't give you a hug on Zoom, but if I would be able to give you a, a nice hug on Zoom with one arm, what is it going to look like? So it's going to be two walls and a little bit of a third wall. Because from the elbow, you see, from the elbow, from the shoulder to the elbow is one wall. And from the elbow to the wrist is a second wall. And then you have a hashlish, it's a filu tefach. And then you have the palm of the hand is exactly one tefach, one hand breath. That's the sukkah. We like a teddy bear hug. So that's why we do four sukkahs. But when you have two walls and a tefach, it says, imagine Hashem's right arm is hugging you. And the arm, it has three joints. It has three sections from the shoulder to the elbow, from the elbow to the wrist, and then you have the third breath. In other words, the wall of a sukkah is Hashem's embrace and the schach of the sukkah is Hashem's roof. Pesach, I take Hashem into my house. Sukkah, Hashem invites me to his house. So Hashem says, listen, in my house, everybody is welcome. You know, there are people whose lives are filled with holes, with gaps. There are people whose lives are perfect. 
and wholesome and impeccable and flawless. Mm -hmm. But our peoples, that their lives are filled with love, with empty spaces. The walls don't go up all the way. The walls don't go down all the way. This is crooked. That's crooked. This doesn't come down. This doesn't come up. There's gaps everywhere. There's broken pieces. Hashem says, it's my house. Every person is welcome. I don't care who you are. You come into my house. I want you to feel that this is your home. When we invite Hashem into our home, we make it perfect. When Hashem invites us into his home, he says, I want everybody to feel comfortable. The Baal Shem Tov was a person, he wanted every type of Jew to be able to feel at home in his house, in his sukkah. So he made this sukkah with every possible loophole. Because let's face it, sometimes we create communities, we create sukkahs, we create homes. That's for perfect people. The f- perfect people come in there. They come into a perfect sukkah and they feel comfortable. But what about all of those people whose lives are filled with gaps and broken pieces? They may not feel comfortable. They come into this place. Nobody welcomes them. Nobody gives them a hug. Nobody embraces them. We all know sometimes you come into a place and you feel you have to fit in perfectly. And if not, and you right away leave. It's not for you. The Baal Shem Tov says, I have to have a sukkah. Call Yisrael Ruyim Leisha B'sukkah. Because every single type of Jew has to be able to feel comfortable here. Not judged. So therefore, he made a sukkah with every conceivable loophole. In many ways, I think Mendy had this quality very much. He didn't judge people by externalities, by the facades. Somebody came into shul, somebody came into the community. It didn't matter. He felt comfortable with everybody, so he could make them feel comfortable with warmth, with love, with sincerity, with passion, a warm shalom aleichem, a warm greeting. What a lesson in life. Some people are too uptight. They don't know how to make people who are not like them feel comfortable. You know, they like everything, structure, structure. Go out of your comfort zone. Don't be so uptight. I don't mean you. I mean all of us. We have to be able to learn how to embrace people, people who are different than us. People who have, everyone is going through their struggles, you know, people who have their own insecurities and they need that extra gesture, that smile. This is something everybody could learn from Mendy. You're in a shul, you're in a community, wherever you are, somebody comes in, you don't know them, they're a stranger, go over to them. Do you have a seat? Do you have where to eat? Where do you come from? How are you? How are you doing? You never know what that achieves. A gesture, a hug. Okay, now it's Corona, so obviously follow the the guidelines of the health officials, but maybe a, a Zoom hug, a virtual hug, but don't underestimate what that type of warmth does, does for people. You know, my dearest friends, <clears throat> I'm going to leave you with one, one final thought. As we go through these days, very special days, Yud, K, Vav, K, Yud, and He, and Vav, and He. It's a journey. And we come to Sukkot. And as I mentioned, Ulekachtem Lechem Bayoim Arishin creates Hadar. On the first day, you take a beautiful, beautiful fruit. But it doesn't say which fruit. It says creates Hadar. The fruit of a beautiful tree. Well, I think all trees are beautiful, and I think all fruits are beautiful. Are cherries not beautiful? I ask you. Tell me. And blueberries are not beautiful? And peaches are not beautiful fruits. And oranges are not beautiful. I mean, I love esroigim. They're also beautiful, but there's a bunch of so many beautiful fruits. And a grape is not beautiful. Take a look. I was, we were having, before the fast, these large, lush green grapes, you know, in Florida. Beautiful, beautiful. How do you know it's an esrog? So this is the oral tradition, but the Gemara Masech Tesukah learns it out from different sources. And one of the sources is Priyat's Hadar. What's Priyat's Hadar? Priyat's Hadar is, it has to be a tree that tam piryoi ve'etzer shava. The fruit and the bark of the tree have the same taste. Interesting. And that's an asterisk. What does this mean? What does this mean? So one of the commentators, Aruch Lener, one of the commentators I saw, he was a botanist. He says something very beautiful. I can't remember which one. I think the Aruch Lene, but maybe somebody else. He says something beautiful. He says with most fruits, the primary part of the fruit is the pulp. But by an esrig, the pulp is very little. It's mostly the rind. 
And the rind tastes very similar to the bark. So that's what the Gemara means, that eights are your period shava. The tree and the fruit, the bark, the trunk, and the fruit have the same taste. Where do you see it in the words priates hadar? Where do you see it in the words priates hadar? So some say, because it could have said pre hadar. We know that a fruit comes from a tree. Pre eights hadar means that the pre is like the eights. But that's not so clear because a vegetable is also called pre, pre hadama. So maybe it has to say pre eights hadar, that it's a tree, it's not a vegetable. It's a fruit, not a vegetable. Svasema so says, brilliant vart. What does he say? He says, in Parshas Bereshis, when God creates trees on Tuesday, he says, Tache Aritz Desha, Esav Mazriya Zera, Eitz Pri Oise Pri Leminoi. God says, the fruit tree that makes fruits. When it happens, on Thursday, when it happens, it says, the earth, the trees gave out fruits, not Eitz Pri. So Chazal say, Hashem wanted that the fruit and the bark should be identical. In reality, that did not happen. In reality, the fruits and the trees don't taste the same. When I eat the bark of a tree, it's, it's not edible. In other words, the fruits violated, the trees violated God's commandment. God wanted to be eights pre, isa pre lamine. The eights should be like the pre. The bark should be like the fruit. The fruit should taste like the bark. In reality, that's not what happened. The earth gave out fruits, but the tree was not like the fruit anymore. Here it says, pre eights hadar. This means the pre is like the eights. It's a gzeri shava from Bereshis, just like in Bereshis when it says, Tachi aritz desh, ace of mazriya zera. Eights pre, here also it says pre eights, as it's fasem, this is a gzeri shava, just like there it means. The bark and the fruit should be identical. Here's the bark and the fruit identical. And he says, that's why an esrig is hadar. What makes it beautiful? It's the only tree that listened to God. The only tree that listened to God, that the bark and the fruit was identical as the esrog. No one else listened. That's what makes it harder. What makes a fruit beautiful? There's no dissonance. It's aligned with Hashem's will. Listen to Hashem. But what's the meaning of this, that the bark and the fruit should be identical? Well, what, what is semantics? What's the idea? What's the secret behind it? So I saw from Rav Kook, Rav Ramitzek HaKayim Kook, first chief rabbi of Israel, he says something beautiful. He says, when a tree grows... You have all the preparations for the fruits, right? You have the roots, you have the stem, you have the trunk, then you have the branches, you have the leaves, you have the flowers, and then you have the fruits. So the end goal is the fruits. But to get to the end goal, you have to go through a lot. You have to plant the tree, to develop roots and trunk and branches and leaves until you get to the fruits. So you have the means and you have the ends. God wanted that the taste of the fruit and the taste of the tree should be identical, which means in life, we always go through many processes in order to get to the end goal. You have to work and study in university in order to get a job. And you have to work many, many years, make your money in order to buy a house. And then you have to grow your work and grow your job and grow your stocks and grow your business in order to make a lot of money so that you can live with more prosperity. And then in order to get married, you have to date and meet and search until you find the right person and you get married. And in order to have children, it takes avoid. And then to raise the children until they become independent adults takes years and years and years and years and years. And many people have the attitude, when am I going to be happy? When am I going to become fully alive. When I finish my goals, right, people will say, you know, now I'm in limbo, I don't have a job. When I get a real job, then I'll be happy. Then they get a job. I work for somebody else. When I work for myself, I'll be happy. What now? You work for you. When I have a house, when I have a house, I'll be happy. Okay, what now? When I have a spouse, when I get married, I'll be happy. Okay, what now? When I have a child? Oh, you have a child. No. When my child grows up and gets out of the house, then I'll be happy. <laughs> That's not how to live. You have to be able to taste the tree and the fruit in an identical fashion. Can you taste in the tree the taste of the fruit? Can you taste in the bark the taste of the fruit? Can you taste in the processes of life the joy of the ultimate goals? Or you can't. Hashem wanted that the way a person should live life is that in the journey, we should experience the delight of the destination. Don't wait for the destination. 
Every part of the journey is essential to the destination. Can you experience the joy and the meaning in every step of the journey? That was Hashem's perspective. In reality, we don't know how to do that, so we never did that. In reality, we live in a world where I wait for the bottom line, and that's when I experience the pleasure. Till then, I'm frustrated, I'm annoyed. This is where there is dissonance. When you experience Hashem in every moment of life, then you realize the journey is the destination. And that's why the pre Hader brings joy. Why does the Esrik bring joy? Joy in life comes when you learn how to taste the taste of the fruit in the bark, the taste of the peri in the tree, the taste of the end product in the journey, the taste of the ultimate culmination of your goal in the processes, in the journey, in the means to the end. When in every moment of life, I'm preparing for something else, but instead of being frustrated, I realize that this is part of the purpose. Then there is joy in life. And I think this is also true of the person whose yard site we're commemorating tonight, my dear friend, Reb Mendi, Zechroinel of Racha, blessed memory. I think he understood this very well. That when your life becomes about serving the Rebbeinu Shalom, serving God, then you don't wait till the end to be happy. Every step of the way has meaning. The journey is essential to the Avayda. And therefore, the taste of the tree is like the taste of the fruit. That's the pre Hadar that brings a person joy. And that's why he had an inner joy. Because this is a joy that comes from when you transcend the frustration. When am I going to get it done? When? No, 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 you don't have to get it done. The working towards it is part of the accomplishment. Don't be a chitzen. Don't be superficial. Every moment has its unique significance. Live life to the fullest. It's the power of now. It's living in the moment. If this is the moment, even if I'm working now to get to another moment, great. Hopefully you'll get to that. But this moment has tremendous opportunity, tremendous significance. Don't dismiss the tree just to get to the fruit. No, no, no. The bark of the tree is as pleasurable as the fruit. There's one tree that understood this. This is the Esrik. That's what made it beautiful. Creates hudder. That's what beauty in life is. That's what harmony in life is. That's what unity in life is. That's what simcha in life is. That's what many present, represented throughout the years in which he graced us. And so I say to all of you tonight, my dearest friends, Mendy Gorin has enriched us. His life has enriched all of us. His death impoverished all of us. But his song will not be interrupted as long as we, you and I and all of us, will continue singing his moving, inspiring, uplifting, sincere, humble, earnest, and committed song. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Rabbi, for those amazing words. That was unbelievable, unbelievable. Um, if anybody has any questions that they'd like to ask the rabbi regarding today's lecture, you can feel free to put it in the post or you can go ahead and raise your hand. i uh, look a little bit of a hand icon on the bottom. I actually have one question for you, Rabbi. I think it's more of a practical question uh, regarding the, the concept of the Yud Kei Vav Kei in these four days coming up. How can you practically bring down a Yud, the Hey, the Vav and a Hey on a practical level? Okay, great question. And uh, very briefly, each one of these letters represents another dimension in our own life. I mentioned this in the lecture, but very briefly. Yud is known as Chachma, Chachma, Hey, Bina, Vav, the Midais, and the last Hey is Malchus. And very briefly, what that means in a person's life is Yud, the first day, is the first flash of awareness. It's called Chachma. Chachma is what you might call an epiphany or a aha moment. It's the awareness of something before it's fleshed out. Hey, the second letter, hey, which is today's day, the yard site, Yud Beis, tonight, is the full awareness, the understanding of it, the developing of it. Vav is translating it into an emotional experience. And the last hey is bringing it down into action. 
So what does this mean in a person's life? Everything begins with a glimmer of awareness. You have to get that awareness. I have to become aware of what's going on. I don't have to understand it fully, but the moment of change always happens with a moment of awareness. It's like, ah, I got it. And how does that happen? You can't make it happen. You can open yourself up to it, pray, and connect to people who can help you. But that's the beginning, a moment of awareness. It could be in your marriage, you're working in your marriage, but as long as you don't have that awareness, that aha moment, nothing is going to help. You really have to get it. And it's not easy. That's the level of chachma. Then that's not enough. Then you have to flesh it out, develop it. That's the next day, right? You got to build it. That's the connection to Mendy. He was a builder. You got to take that blueprint and you got to build it. You got to develop it. Then that's all ideas, right? Now you got to live in the building. And that's the next level, the Vav. The Vav is really processing it in a way that is emotionally tangible and emotionally concrete, which means not just an idea, but it's basically an idea that becomes emotionally relevant, becomes part of me, becomes part of my emotional experience, which as you know, is not so easy for people. Sometimes things just stay abstract. I'm not excited about it. It doesn't touch me. And then the last hey is malchut, is delivering. Delivering are the tangible changes that I create in my life as a result. So these are the four letters which are the building blocks of creation. Goyach, Rabbi, thank you very much. Did that make it more practical or less practical? <laughs> it made it pretty practical to me and obviously on a, on a situation. I know, that you, I know that you have mystical... Uh, Tendency. So I thought for you it will be practical enough, but I know for others it wasn't that practical. <laughs> <laughs> Rabbi, we also have with us here um, Helga, who would like to actually say some words. I'm going to unmute sure. for a second. Be an honor. Yeah. Second. There we go. Helga, you're there. You're good. Hi, Rabbi. I just want to thank you very, very, very much for your beautiful words about Mendy and about the class. And you're always so inspirational and you hit the mark because every word somehow affects what we are going through in our daily journey. And thank you. Thank you. Can't thank you enough. Thank you. And thank you for bringing us all together. And thank you for the special partner that you were for him. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank uh, my children and Michael, especially for helping me put this together and to Rabbi Wolf for his love and support and to all my family. That's the biggest blessing that Mendy has left. Yeah. Beautiful family. His brothers, his sister-in-laws, my sisters, everything. A beautiful family indeed. Warm, warm. And I bless you that you should always remain united and close because there's no greater blessing than that. Amen. I'm going to tell you something. You'll forgive me for saying this. I've been around a lot of places. And sometimes it takes petty people and petty arguments and families split apart. And Mendy was like a patriarch. He knew how to keep things together always. It's very, very important. Even if there's, you know, people have disagreements and people have personality differences, but never to allow a family to drift away. Very, very important. So I bless you that you should always be able to maintain that beautiful and amazing unity. And even if there's a challenging moment and sometimes somebody, you know, not everybody, not everybody is perfect. And not, every, not everybody is so forgiving as Mendy. It's important to be able to be honest with each other and open with each other and to be able to learn how to, you know, speak with respect, but with openness. And when there's differences to iron them out, because when a family is united, it is one of the greatest blessings, especially for children growing up. When you have that click, that family, that social connection, it's very healthy for teenagers because today with technology, there's so much depression and isolation. And one of the key miracles that can help kids is strong families. So keep that up. Don't, 
Don't let that go because it's a tremendous blessing and you have it. So make sure to maintain it. And 